All right. Blast off of Torah studies. Welcome. It's great to have you all. So this week we have a yeah. incredible Torah studies class. And I'll tell you what the topic is. The topic is all about inner character. And I want to share, I want to share one of my favorites. Okay, here we go. I want to share one of my favorites. Everybody have a nice clean background. At any point in time, you know the drill, unmute and jump in. Okay, so I want to tell one of my favorite stories. I feel like I told this recently. So if you heard it recently, just pretend like I didn't and smile. Um, but the story goes with a professor whose name was Bertrand Russell. And he was a professor many, many years ago. Forget which university. He was an ethicist and a philosopher and a mathematician and all this stuff. He taught all sorts of fields of academia. And, um, but one of his main classes was on ethics. Well, turns out he did something quite unethical. What it was, I don't know. Maybe I do know, but I wouldn't share because that's unethical. Lush and horror, right? We don't, we don't speak to spare shit. Anyway, so he, was, he did something unethical and one of his colleagues found out about it and called him out on it and said, look, I'm going to say how we would say it in, in yeshiva and Jewish terminology. How you talking? Like, how, how is this appropriate? Like, how does this make sense? You're teaching all day. You're speaking about the idea of ethics and you're not ethical. What is this? Let's, let's talk about uh, what's the word I'm looking for. Hypocrite, right? Being hypocritical, not being consistent. Maybe that's a nicer phrase. What about the consistency? So listen to this. You'll love this. And you probably know it, but I'm saying it again. Doesn't matter. He said, look, I teach mathematics. Sorry. I teach trigonometry. And I'm not a triangle. That, that was his answer. In other words, who says his argument was, again, his argument, Professor Russell's argument was, who says you have to be what you preach? Maybe you can preach one thing and do something completely different. Look, this is a very, very important topic to talk about. It's a very compelling topic. And I think for all of us, there is attention, whether it's with us or with those that we love or those that we know, this idea of consistency, um, honesty, consistency. Am I being true to message? Am I not being true to what I espouse, to what I profess to believe in? So along these lines, an anecdote, an anecdote. Um, I've talked about this before. Again, I'm just, I'm, I'm in the, I'm right now in repeating mode. So if you've heard me, it's okay. You know, the, I, the reality is that oftentimes we'll take the moral education that we give our children and essentially, you know, flush it down the tubes. What do I mean by that? I mean, um, when it comes to the, the copies that don't work, for some reason, the printer is not. Anyway, so the, um, we take this, the, the moral teachings, the ethical teachings, the Jewish teachings that we give our kids, and you know, in, in an act of saving a few bucks, we flush it down the toilet. For example, you go to Disney, and we tell the kid, we tell our child, oh, look, if you're 12 and under, you only pay, Disney's expensive, like a million dollars. I'm kidding. You pay only like $100. $100. If you're over 12, it's like 130 so say that you're 12, even though you're 13 already, say that you're 12, let's get a discount, blah, blah, blah. And meanwhile, the behavior that's modeled is one of lack of honesty. So that, that does, so you're, you're, you're preaching otherwise honesty, but you're living in practice when, when, when the rubber hits the road, so to speak, when money's at stake, well, that's, it's different, but right? we check ethics at the door, right? It's like when you go on an airplane, which sounds complicated nowadays. I'm just saying, just based on the news report, it sounds complicated. But anyway, when you go on an airplane, you know, you sometimes have to check your, you know, like you have a carry-on and you think you're safe. And then they're like, oh, we've, we're out of carry-on space. You ever have that? You're on a flight and you got your carry-on bag. No more overhead, oh, no more overhead space. So now you have to do the old, what do they call it? Cabin check? No, what do they call it? A gate check. Gate check? Yeah. Gate okay, check, maybe. yes. You got to check it, but you check it on the on the thing on the like the, on the down ramp. You put your tag on it, and I see the guys. They take it, they throw it down the stairs. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, no, no. They 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 move it. They 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 take it and all that good stuff. 
But anyway, it's like, it's you kind of check your bags, you know, right before you get on, you get on the flight, oh, you check, check your stuff, you know, send it out. So it's kind of like, yeah, we have all these values, we have all these morals, we have all these principles. And then when things get a little bit, you know, ooh, like things get a little bit tight, it's like, all right, we'll get rid of that one. Like, yeah, we don't really need that one. But what happened? Wasn't that a big value? Yeah, but not now, because now we need to save, got to save 10%. So I say that by way of introduction, because today's class is all about character development and morality and ethics and what it means to be, to be a mensch which is, I think, an important lesson, important discussion for all of us, especially when, it, when we think about the context of, um, the, in the context of leadership, because really there's a question that one could ask with regards to leadership, not picking on anyone in particular, but you know, when it comes to leadership, is it enough to be an efficient um, manager? Or when it comes to leadership, does one have to model ethical behavior? So let me kind of explain where I'm coming with this, where I'm coming from with this. So used to be, and who, how, I haven't been around that long, right? But my understanding is it used to be that no one looked too closely at what the kings were doing, right? If you had a king, right? No one was looking too deeply at what the king was doing. Were they moral? Were they ethical? Were they um, living, leading, you know, morally upstanding lives? They were the king. They had the power. What are you going to do? Whistleblowers, press, exposés, op-eds. What, who, like, what is this? Right? Interviews? That, that's not happening. And governments and politicians followed suit, right? You know, you had great leaders that might not have been the best people. And I think there was almost a sense of, I'm not, I'm not justifying anything. I'm just trying to explain an error that maybe I wasn't around for, but my understanding <laughs> perhaps is, right? Just because I don't know doesn't mean I can't make it up. So that's what we're doing right now. So it might have been that there was an agreement. The agreement was like, a, like an unspoken agreement. You take care of what your, what your job description is, which is govern and lead and you know whatever, whatever your description is. And that's it. We're not going to dig any deeper. That's it. All right. But today, that's not the case. Today, that's, today, it's not the case. If there are skeletons in a politician's closet, it's coming out, and that's it. They're gone. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. Sometimes. Some. Okay. All right. Let's just say at least someone's talking about it. But maybe they're not always gone, but at least there are some that are saying he should be gone or she should be gone. Okay, fine. And oftentimes gone. I mean, I'm, it's, it's not prudent. It's not, it's not a political conversation. It's a conversation about leadership. So it's not any side. It's not any individual. Although we can all think of, of, of individuals that either lost their positions or did it, whatever it is. The point is that there's a question, there's a tension. It, it's really, you know, I could, we could really put it as a poll question. Do you think that somebody in a very specific job should lose that job if they violate something that seems to be unrelated to that job. In other words, the fact that they're not a mensch, maybe that's, a, that's a, you know, an understatement, does that affect the job? In other words, one second, let me, let me back up. Let me, let, me, let me set the question the way, the way I want the question to be set. If the leader is, the, whatever, whether it's a president, a governor, a mayor, whatever it is, if they're doing their job effectively, but they're not a nice person, they're not a mensch. Does one have to do with the other? The fact that they're not a mensch, should that affect their ability or their capacity? Or should we say you're not fit to lead because of X, Y, and Z? But hold on one second. I'm not fit to lead. I'm doing a great job. Yeah, but look at all this stuff. In other words, do we, do we, follow Bertrand Russell's theory that you don't have to be a triangle to teach trigonometry. And you can say, therefore, that, look, let me do, I have my own stuff. I, I'm doing my own thing. You may not like it. It is what it is. But I'm, I'm, I'm teaching. I'm leading. I'm doing my thing. That, 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 that doesn't get in the way. Just because I don't fit a certain mold shouldn't take, or do we say, no, one affects the other, or one should, to, should affect the other in the sense that it, uh, it negates the, the capacity to lead. So that's really the, 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 the core opening question. I, it's, it's, not a, it's not a question really that's, that's meant for, 
you know, a specific answer. It's just a thought to think about as we go through today's class. Okay. So today's class is going to focus primarily on, in other words, the Torah part of today's class is going to focus on the difference between the experience of the biblical characters. And when I say biblical characters, I mean the patriarchs and matriarchs, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, right? These biblical characters are matriarchs and patriarchs and our experience post-Sinai. So it's basically pre-Sinai Judaism and post-Sinai Judaism. So let me explain what I mean. Abraham is colloquially referred to as the first Jew. Abraham and Sarah, the first Jewish couple. What made them Jewish? I right, become the first Jew. Were they really Jewish? Was Judaism a thing? When did Judaism become a thing? Who decided? Right? Who said Judaism begins now? When did that happen? Did it happen with Abraham? Did it happen with the Exodus and, and the giving of the Torah at Sinai? We could look at it different ways. Um, again, I said colloquially, which means like just the way we speak about it informally, Judaism begins with Abraham. Abraham is the father of Jewish monotheism, not only believing in one God, but also teaching that and sharing that and trying to affect the world and improve the world with that, with that idea. Okay, so that's, that's the, Abraham is the father of monotheism. And we also know in our tradition that Abraham and Sarah kept the whole Torah even before it was given, which is a bit of a bold statement which might take uh, some of us aback. One second, what do you mean? They, they, they kept the Torah before Sinai. How did, how did they know what to keep? So it says that there was some, you know, um, when, when uh, agencies or agents leaked documents, you know, there was just a, a major offshore document leak. You guys know, heard about this? The Pandora Papers, yes, which is a, a follow-up of the Panama Papers a few years ago. You guys with me? I see some people are nodding. If not, you can Google Pandora Papers. It's not a music thing, although Pandora is a music service. Pandora Papers is a leak of, what, billions of pages? Millions or billions of, of documents that pertain to um, offshore accounts, things that are going on in uh, money, financial things, and that, that could be potentially damaging. It's kind of similar to what we're talking about. When you have the leader of a country that meanwhile has all this wealth and whatever, you know, does that make them unfit? Does that cancel them? Okay, fine. So that, you know, some, sometimes documents leak. Documents that are meant to be private leak. The same thing is true with Torah. It says that the Torah leaked before Sinai. There was a copy and it leaked. Abraham had a copy. Isaac had a copy. Jacob had a copy. The patriarchs had a copy. It says that from the time of the patriarchs, it never, there never ceased to be the study of Torah. The Levites, the tribe of Levi that were not enslaved in Egypt, what were they doing? They were the priests. What were they doing? They were studying Torah. What Torah? Torah wasn't given till Sinai. They got the pre-release edition. They got the leaked edition of Torah. That's what they were studying. That's what it says. It says that Abraham kept all of the mitzvot except for one. And he did all, he knew the whole Torah. He kept all the mitzvot except for one. That's the mitzvah of circumcision. That one, he waited till God told him. Anyway, the point is that the patriarchs kept all the mitzvot. But so, so therefore one might ask the obvious question. So then what happened at Sinai? What, it just became public? It became not like a leak. The, the, oh, before this was a leaked version. Now you can rest assured you're not pirating Torah pirating like our right a pirate but now it's legal now you have it officially that's what happened at sinai that's why it's a, such a big deal because it's official it's legal come on it's got to be more than that. so this leads us into text number one which is from the fifth chabad rebbe rabbi shalom dover schneerson actually rabbi shalom dover schneerson the rebbe Rashab, my son my third son who's celebrating his bar mitzvah soon uh, next weekend is named after this very Rabbi Shalom Dover. I know next week, right? Crazy. Rabbi Shalom Dover Schneerson, the Rabbi Rashab. So um, he explains in Hasidic terminology what happened at Sinai and what's the difference between pre and post Sinai. This is a very important text and it really kind of frames our entire discussion today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up the, the text on the screen. 
and we're going to do this together. Okay, let's, I hope this is the right one. Yes. Here we go, text number one. Um, Dr. Maxi, if you don't mind, please read text number one. All right. Thank you. Our sages of blessed memory said that Abraham, our patriarch, fulfilled the entire Torah before it was given. The same was true of Isaac and Jacob. However, each served God in a unique way. Abraham served God through his hospitality, Isaac by digging wells, and Jacob by erecting rods at the riverbank. Why did they not have a uniform practice as we have today? In other words, so let me just jump in for a second. So we have this tradition that the patriarchs studied Torah, kept them in school. They, they, did, they, they did their Jewish thing even before the Torah was given. But each one yeah. did their own way. And his question is, why not? Why wasn't it uniform like it is today, post-Sinai? Continue, please. Our patriarchs worshiped God by nurturing their spiritual connection to God. They translated their spiritual devotions into action only to provide a platform in the physical world for their spirituality. But their main objective remained spiritual refinement. Inasmuch as each patriarch's spiritual makeup was unique, they served God in different ways. For example, Abraham, whose soul was characterized by kindness, served God with kindness and therefore invited guests. The same applies to Isaac with his wells and Jacob with his rods. At Sinai, God gave us actionable mitzvot, meditation, and intention are indeed still required, but action is primary. And with respect to action, we are all equal. Therefore, we have a uniform set of mitzvot. Thank you. So let me explain. It's it's a uh, it, it's a relatively dense text. I mean, it's not too over the top, but it, it needs a little bit of explanation. So let me jump in on this and, and, and try to try to unpack this. Basically, what he's saying is like this. Before Sinai, devotion and, and service of God was really about, in a way, self-expression. It's like, I'm going to serve God the way I am wired to do so. So if I'm a person that's all about love, so I'm going to serve God by doing things that are that, ser- that that are about love. So I'm going to invite people in. I'll be hospitable. I'll have hospitality. Like, I'm going to serve God and do good things in in my in in my image, essentially. Isaac, who was more of a disciplinarian, and and what I mean by disciplinarian, so he was more kavura, as we would say in Kabbalah, which means more of an internal work. It's not about like giving. It's more about like the inner work. So he served God by digging wells. What does it mean to dig wells, right? He did that practically, but, but what does it mean conceptually? Digging a well means that you're, the water's there, but it's obstructed, right? There's earth separating between you and the water. So you dig the well. Digging the well means that you, un, you take away, you remove the earth to bring out the water. That's a very, it's, it's, it's introspective work. It means digging inside, cleaning up the personality, removing the debris, removing the coarseness of our personality, removing our egos to allow our neshama, to allow the soul to come out. That's internal work. Abraham is hosting parties, right? And inviting people over and saying, guys, thank God for the food. It's amazing, right? That's Abraham's modality of serving God. And Isaac, it's inner work. It's inner work. Jacob has the rods, which I don't want to get into. It's a complicated story. It's with the animals and the rods. Remember the animals, the cut, the striped animals. All right, whatever. The point is like this. Before Sinai, the main idea of how we connected with God was based on us. I feel like I'm not saying that, that, that uh, so clearly. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs, when they served God, when they connected with God, it was primarily driven by their own personalities. So what they did was framed and molded by who they were. So they served God. I'm going to use a phrase here. Forgive me. You know, they served God in their image, right? As they were. It's like you ask somebody, what's your favorite mitzvah? They'll tell you what the, that's a great way to find out their personality, right? They served God as they were. Because fundamentally before Sinai, the main thing was that character development was the inner, was the inner work. So you had to work with who you were. You had to work from where you were in order to connect with God. And that's where they connected with God with their own personality. Well, post-Sana, it's different. 
post Sinai, it's not about, it's less about you as an individual and more about getting a certain task or job done. In other words, it's less about the person and it's more about the action. It's less about the individual's character refinement and it's more about a task that needs to be done in this world. So tzedakah, for example, right? Tzedakah. Is giving tzedakah an act of exercising my generosity, which speaks to the personal, you know, that, that the personal experience, or is it primarily an experience where we satisfy a need that exists? In other words, there's a need that exists and giving tzedakah fulfills that need and, and takes care. Let's say somebody doesn't have food. So helping that person get food, that's the main thing. So yeah, there is the generosity part of it, but we can look also at the effect. So is it the action? I don't know. I don't want to get tripped up in the language. Is it, is it me or is it the outcome? Is it what I'm doing or is it the outcome? So before Sinai, right? Prior to Sinai, there was an emphasis. It was a little bit more about the individual. It's about the way I connect, the way I refine my character and work on myself through, through and, 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 and by connecting with God. Post Sinai, it's more about the experience of getting it done, which is why he said in text number one, that that's why post Sinai, all the mitzvot are the same. It's not about a personal experience. It's, it's about uniform action. It's about uniform effect. It's about a uniform objective. This is what has to get done. We need everybody on board doing the action to get the job done. All right, let me take a step back and check in. Does this make sense? Sort of, yes, a little bit. He's saying it's less personal. Right, so pre sane seems more personal, right, 100%. So, right, so that. Right. So pre-Sinai, it's personal. It's coming from your heart. It's like a, it's an expression of who you are, individu individuality. Right. Right. And, and that's kind of what he's saying is the distinction that before Sinai, it was more about the person developing. It was a character development experience. So therefore, it was intrinsically, it was inherently, it was essentially connected with one's character. And it had to be an expression of your character to have that development of character. Whereas post sign, it's less about the character development and more about what needs to be done. So it sounds like you're saying, right, Sandrine, that, <laughs> right? No, but it sounds like that you're saying that before Sinai was, uh, was a more personal, warmer experience. Now it's like cold, it's action. It's just like, these are the tasks, check, check, check. It's not about me, it's about getting the job. It sounds a little robotic. It sounds a little bit... Uh, Okay, fine, good. So that's what we're going to deal with tonight. Because, see soon, the Rebbe asks uh, just a monster question on this. But before we ask the question, which is going to touch on what you're saying, before we ask the question, again, I just want to make sure we have this clear. So, hey, Karen, good to see you. Hey. So the patriarchs studied Torah, they did mitzvot, but it was primarily about themselves. It was about their own character development, their own self-expression, their own journey to discover God and to, to reach out to God. Post-Sinai, it's God telling us this is what he wants done. So it's less of a personal touch, less of a personal experience, and more about, yeah, kosher, Shabbos, tefillin, mezuzah, tzitzis, whatever. It's, it's the laws, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Shofar, Matzah. It's not about I want to do it's more about what has to get done. Okay, so that's the distinction. And that answers the question that answers the question we had before. What, what happened at Sinai? What happened at Sinai was there was a shift away from the personality and more toward a, a goal. It was it's it moves more toward goal oriented. Like Judaism is less about faith and belief and more about action. Right? Do I believe? Do I have to believe? It's good if I believe, but it's also good if I get the mitzvah done. The Rebbe says, however, and that's the way it's typically understood. And when I say typically understood, I mean in Kabbalah, 
in Hasidic philosophy in Hasidut. That's the way it's understood in the deep from the deeper text. Text one that we just read that, that lays this out, one of the many texts that lays out this concept and this duality, this distinction between pre and post Sinai. That's a Hasidic work. That's a Chabad work. But the Rebbe asks a question. The Rebbe says, that, that doesn't make any sense. Because if that's the case, this is how the Rebbe, the Rebbe would ask questions. Because if that's the case, that in a post-Sinai world, character development and personal intention doesn't matter as much as getting the job done. It's more action-oriented. If that is the case, then why are we reading all these stories about the patriarchs? If the patriarchs lived in a different world, in a different zone, in a different reality, in a different Jewish modality, then why would we have a whole book of Genesis focusing on the experience of the patriarchs if that's completely irrelevant to our experience? You understand the question? Sandrine, it's basically your question, but, but framed in a academic, in a, in a uh, Torah-based way. In other words, your question was, it doesn't sound right. Something's missing here. What do you mean we don't have a personal? That, that doesn't sound right. The Rebbe asked essentially the same question, but from a kind of like from a, from a, st a study place. Like one second, you're telling me that we live in a different world. So then why is it there in the Bible? Why is it in Torah? If that's I, not I, us, then why are we reading it? And why are they our role models? Why are they role models? Why are they being presented as lessons, patriarchs, matriarchs, one? And understand this. You know, Torah is precise. The word Torah actually means instruction, guidance. People always say, oh, I wish life came with an instruction manual. Spoiler alert, it does. We call it Torah. Not everyone knows it yet. Okay, fine. Also, like when you read it, you may not be able to read. You ever get those instructions and you're like reading it like this? It makes sense. So sometimes, you know, you look at it. It's like, what is this? Hebrew, Chinese, who knows? Anyway, the point is we have an instruction manual. And the instruction manual includes one whole section, a fifth of the book, is about something that, according to what we just said, is irrelevant to the operation of our machine, of our individual, of, of our beings. It doesn't make sense. It's impossible to say that that's outdated, that that's out, out, uh, um, not out, old fashioned. Can't say that. Let me articulate. I'll show you. We'll study text two together, and you'll see here where the Rebbe asked this question, black and white. Okay, text two. I'll read this one. Every detail in the Torah, which is a book of instruction, is a lesson to us post-Sinai Jews on how, to on how to better serve God, right? Every word of Torah is for us post-Sinai Jews, how to serve God. If this is the case, why does Torah spill so much ink? No, the Rebbe didn't say spill so much ink. That's a, that's a translator's um, <laughs> very spill so much ink. The rebel wouldn't, wouldn't use such an expression, by the way, just so you know, spill has a negative connotation. Why does the Torah spill so much ink on the story of how our patriarchs worship God? Again, if it's all about guiding us post-Sinai, so why talk about the models that are not our models? Why talk about how the patriarchs worship God? If their method of worship Look at this. Here's the line. If their method of worship was different from our contemporary method of worship, how can their story teach us how to serve God better? They serve God based on their own personality, based on their trying to reach God in their own way. It was about character development first and action second. So it didn't matter what they did as much as where it was coming from. That was for them. And for us, it's less about how we feel and more about what we do. It's more about the outcome. We're more outcome-oriented Judaism or action-oriented Judaism. Great. Sure. You want to create the divide, pre-sign a, post-sign a, patriarchs, us. Sure. I'll buy it. But then why are we learning about it? Why are we learning about the pre-sign experience? If not, that that also has a lesson for us post-sign. Of course, the Rebbe asked the question in a way that points to the answer. The very fact that the patriarch and matriarch's lives are detailed in the Torah, when they were living character first, personality first, and action second, means that even in a post-Sinai world, where action is allegedly primary, character matters. I hope you see the connection between the opening of this class and our discussion now, right? 
Character matters. Personal development matters. Intention matters. It's not just about what we do. It's not just about are we effectively fulfilling the task that we were hired to do, but it's how we are as human beings while we're doing it that also matters. Does that make sense? So whereas some texts make a clean divide, they do this um, lobotomy, if you will, and say, oh, two different realities, two different eras, pre-Sinai. It's not about the action. Yeah, they did stuff, but that's whatever. They, one guy dug wells, and well, he put up rods, and he invited people up. It was about their way to speak to God, to reach out to God, to express the fact that they loved God, or they believed it. It was about them and their development. Okay, that's pre-sign. Post-sign is more about action. The fact that we're learning about a whole book of Genesis. 10, no, 12 Torah portions. 12 in Genesis. Plus Shmot, Va'era, Bo, Bishalach, Shmot, Va'era, Bo, Bishalach. Plus four, 16 Torah portions out of 53. 16 out of 53 happen pre, happen pre Sinai. Torah portion number 17 is where Sinai, the giving of the Torah happens. You're telling me that 16 Torah portions were penned, were, were given to us to study and to meditate about, and they don't speak to us? She's telling us what, what used to be the, you know, the old school approach. You got to be kidding. The Rebbe says, no, not happening. Can't be true. Can't be true. It must be. That even in a world, even in a reality where action is primary, character development is also, is also um, of, of paramount importance. I want to share with you the Hebrew terminology. Let's just get on the same page with some terminology. It's good to also know the, the original terms. There is maisa, which means action, and kavana, or kavana, which means intention. So what's primary, the action or the intention? I'll give you an example. Give you an example. If if you took the strict, you'll love this example, by the way. If you took the strict divide, if you took the divide strictly, as it seems, based on other texts before the Rebbe's question, here's what would come out. Before Sinai, where intention is everything. So if you intended, right, to do a mitzvah, but it didn't actually work out, you would still get the mitzvah because it was all about intention. So for example, give you a real story. A biblical story. You guys know the story. Remember when Abraham was visited after circumcision by a few, uh, a few good men? Yeah? Three men. Who were they? Were they men? Who were they? Angels. Angels. They were angels. Yeah. Well, what did he do? He fed them. So I'm going to ask you a very simple question. There's a mitzvah to feed your guests. Did he get the mitzvah? Did he do the mitzvah? Because understand this, the angels couldn't eat. They didn't eat. So do you get the mitzvah of feeding, angel, of feeding guests if they never ate? In a pre-Sinai world, of course you do. Because it's all about your generosity. It's about your character development. So you went and prepared the food and served the food. Whether they ate it or not, it's irrelevant, right? Because it's, it's about me. So in a pre-Sinai world, of course you get the mitzvah. In a post-Sinai world where it's not about you as much as about feeding the hungry, feeding the guests, well, there was no guest that ate. You didn't actually feed a guest. You understand the difference? Yeah, in a pre-Sinai world, it's all about you, so you got the mitzvah. Post-Sinai world, it's all about getting the action done. The action didn't happen. Conversely, I told you you'll love this. I hope you love this. It's hard to tell, but I, I, I love this. That, you, that for sure we know. In a post-Sinai world, the opposite is true. I'll give you another scenario. Let's say, for example, you're walking down the street and you have a $10 bill in your pocket. And it happens to be in the same pocket as your phone. Ever, ever, has this ever happened to you? You pull out your phone or your keys or your wallet and out comes, poof, the money. No, it happens all the time, right? Yeah. Okay, good. It's happens all the time. I don't even put money with my phone. It still happens. I'm kidding, right? So right, it happens. You pull out something, the other thing comes out. So imagine like this. Imagine you drop $10 and you never know about it. You never remember. You don't remember later. Oh, I had it. You never, you, you went through the rest of your life and you didn't even remember that you had $10 that you dropped. But you know what happened? Someone 
that was a needy person, someone that needed that money desperately. At a later point in time, a few minutes later, walked by, found the money and said, thank God that $10, now I can eat a meal. Let me ask you a question. Did you do a mitzvah of tzedakah? In a post-Sinai post world, did you do a mitzvah? Yes, you did. Because your money fed someone who's hungry. In a pre-Sinai world, where it's all about your expression of generosity, did you do that mitzvah? No, you didn't. Because you didn't do something generous. It happened accidentally. You may, you may never even know about it. So how could you have, your character in this process was not developed. You with me on this? You didn't become a more, you didn't express generosity. You don't even know what happened. So from a character development perspective, nada. From an outcome perspective, feeding the hungry, you got it. So I'm giving you two scenarios. Abraham feeding the angels, where the feeling was there, but the, the eating wasn't there. And the experience of dropping money and somebody picks it up, where the action is there, but the feeling is not there as being a study in contrast. Pre-Sinai, post-pre-Sinai, it's all about you. Post-Sinai, it's all about the other and the action. Okay, good. I hope that's pretty clear. But again, that's how we would have thought of it, thought of it before the Rebbe's question. The Rebbe pulls out this bomb of a question and says, one second, you can't make a clean divide. Not so fast. I mean, sure, theoretically, it sounds good, but practically, if, if God gave us Post-Sinai Jews, God gave us the Torah. It must be that their stories are relevant and informative and instructive to us as well, which means that even in a post-Sinai world that's all about outcome and all about action and all about the effect that we have in the world, making the world a better place, etc., even in that world of uniformity, there is still a focus on character development. And let me explain why. Because the question now is, in a world where it's all about outcome, so then who cares how you feel, what you think, if you believe, if you're really feeling generous or just doing it, who cares? So here's one approach. Here's one approach to answering the question. And that approach is, That in addition to getting stuff done in this world, we are also, all of us, are God's ambassadors on earth. And if we are God's ambassadors, we got to be a match. You with me on this? There's a, there's, if God is act, let me explain. In an action oriented world post sign where it's all about God says, I need, I need you to give this person money. I could do it, God says. I could do it, but then I don't need you here, right? Then I don't need you. So you're here, and they're here. I, I need you to give them. I could do it, but this is your job. Give them. They need, you have, they need, give. And everyone has what to give. Whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's emotional support, whether it's psychological support, whether it's mentoring, whether it's as, as educating, whatever it is, right? Everyone has what to give. Jewishly, you know an Aleph, teach an Aleph, right? Donna, I'm quoting you. Donna B, right? As you said recently to me. Know an Aleph, teach an Aleph. So here's the point. There's two ways to look at that. God says, you're the one to give that person. Or God says something even deeper. When you give to that person, I'm giving through you. I'm giving. You're the one that's giving on my behalf. Are you with me in the distinction? Either it's right, person A gives to person B, or person A is acting as a shliach, as a representative of God Almighty, to do what God wants to be done on earth. When we look at ourselves as God's emissary, then character does matter. Then who we are does make a difference. Then kavana absolutely is part of the equation. Because how can you channel God on earth? Yeah, you can do the action, but how can you represent God on earth if we're not, I said you, now I'm switching to we, how could we represent God if we are not 
working on ourselves at the same time. So I want to share with you. I want to share with you um, text five from the Zohar. Beautiful Kabbalistic text. Okay. Take a look at this. Rabbi Yossi said, the divine presence only rests in a place that is complete, not in a place that is incomplete and not in a place that is defective. So it's kind of like water in a cup. I actually have in front of me water in a cup. It's magic. There's water in here. I'm not going to spill on my computer, but there's water in this cup. Yeah. So the water will only stay in the cup as long as the cup, it has its integrity. If there's a hole in the cup, if there's a part of the cup missing, the, the water will seep right through. It's not going to happen. You know, the worst thing that could happen after you build a mikvah and you fill it with rainwater, which is very difficult to get like natural rainwater into a mikvah. It's very complicated how to engineer that. The worst thing is when you discover, if God forbid you discover there's a leak, it's a leaky mikvah and all your water drained out and you got to start again. Right. If there's a hole, it leaks through. The Zohar says, Rabbi Yossi says, Shkinta lesharia ella ba'asar shlim. It's Aramaic. It's almost like Hebrew, but it's Aramaic. Shkinta, the Shkina, the divine presence, does not rest only in an asar shlim, only in a place that is shalem, that is complete, that is whole, that has integrity. If there is, if it's incomplete or if it's defective, it doesn't hold God, and that is the message for us vis-a-vis -vis character development and character improvement and working on our inner selves, even as we focus on getting the tasks that God wants us to get done, done. Even as we are action-oriented mitzvah first, we cannot neglect our characters because at the end of the day and the beginning of the day, mind you, God does not hang out in a place that is incomplete which means in a place of a character that's not befitting of God to hang out. So what we have here is the, is the counter message to the message that is typically shared. Typically the message that's shared is that Judaism is all about action. Mitzvahs, getting it done, how you feel, what you believe in, it's, not, it's less important. Whether you believe or don't believe, whether you're excited or not excited, get the mitzvah done. If somebody's in need, help them out, right? If it's time to pray, pray, but I don't want to, I don't like it. Ah, it's okay, you'll, you'll, you'll learn to love it or you won't. Either way, do the right thing. Do the mitzvah. Just do it, right? With the chauffeur insignia, right? Just do it. That's the, a Nike stole it. Nike, that's, it's whatever, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. Anyway, so what's the point? We typically think it's all about action. And, and on one level, we say that it is. But there's another part of the story. And that is, if we want God to hang out in our actions, if we want to be able to, in our mitzvah actions, represent God on earth, if we want our tzedakah, if we want our tefillin, if we want our Torah study to be together with God's presence, God doesn't hang out unless we're working, at least we're working on ourselves. Are we ever going to be complete? I know that's a very high bar that the Zohar sets. God doesn't rest only in a complete space. Who could ever say they're complete? I know, I'm with you on that. But at least a place where we're working on our character development. And that's why the Rebbe says. That's why we have a whole book of the Torah, a book and a third of the, of the five books of Moses, where we read the story of the patriarchs and the matriarchs and how they developed their character. And Abraham served with love and Isaac with reverence and Jacob with compassion and they each serve god with their emotional attributes and their perfection to remind us that even as we do torah we have to also feel even as we focus on action we have to have intention and even as we get the job done we have to be a match so circling back to our opening conversation right is it enough to be an effective leader let's say right, to an effective um, governor, I don't mean specifically like governor of the state, but is it, is, is it enough to effectively govern others while one's own inner life is not where it should be? 
If you're only looking at action and outcomes, you might say yes. But if you look at it from a divine perspective, right? The fact that we are not just meant to, especially when it comes to Torah Mitzvot, not just meant to get it done, but meant to bring God into that experience, then there's necessarily something lacking if we are not at the very least working on ourselves to become more of a mensch. Um, I want to share with you a beautiful text. <coughs> I'm going to go back a little and, and share text 3B. Okay, take a look at this one. Text 3B, I'm going to read this one out loud. This is a quote from, from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He says, at Mount Sinai, God gave Moses his Torah in a format that transcends anything that a created being can absorb. The Torah is beyond what we can really fathom. Therefore, Moses would learn the Torah and forget it until God granted it to him as a gift. Moses would learn, but it was too big. Even Moses, it was too big for Moses. So God gave it to him as a gift. God, who is omnipotent, could do anything, and can link the infinite to the finite, gifted his infinite Torah to a finite created human. <clears throat> the same holds true for every Jew. We too can absorb and preserve God's Torah because he granted it to each of us as a gift. But what, what's required then, if that's the relationship, then we have to do our part to be a match. So what's the, what's the big idea? Even as we focus on action, we have to also focus on the inside. <clears throat> to be a complete vessel, which leads me to our final step. Because even as we are a complete vessel, we're reminded that the most complete vessel is the broken vessel. And now it seems like I'm just talking in, in riddles and talking in tongue and not making tongues and not making any sense. It sounds like a double talk. We just read from the Zohar that God only rests in a complete place. And now I'm telling you that the most complete place is a broken place. What do I mean? So I'm going to quote the great Katzka Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Katzka, who liked to speak in contradictions. He once said the following, there's nothing, one second, there's nothing as crooked as the straight face of a con man. There's nothing as black, as dark, as the white burial shrouds. There's nothing as straight as a crooked ladder. And there's nothing as whole as a broken heart. That's what he said. And we don't have time to get into all of those ideas. And I mentioned these before, and we've, we've even done classes where we've taken a deep dive into each four of these statements. But he liked speaking in very sharp and very, you know, very sharp ways of expressing things. You know, a con man, the straight face of a con man is the most crooked thing out there. If a con man looks, looks, looks like honest, don't believe. Right? There's nothing as dark, as, 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 as mournful as the white burial shrouds that doesn't need explanation. Nothing as straight as a crooked ladder. A ladder to work needs to be leaning against something. So you're getting up somewhere. Otherwise, if it's just pointing straight up, you're not going anywhere really. I mean, you're going up somewhere, but not, not to any destination. Um, and there's nothing as whole as a broken heart. That's the one that we're going to focus on. The Kutzke Rebbe says that the, the, the most complete heart is a heart that is broken. Doesn't mean a damaged heart doesn't mean a shattered heart. What it means is a heart that has contrition, a heart that's contrite, a heart that's, that's humbled, a person in, within whom the ego is not running away with him. The most complete person is a person who knows who they are, knows their shortcomings, knows their strengths also, but understands where their... Where their Being ends. Knowing one's limitations is absolutely liberating because now you can get outside yourself. If I never know my limitations, so maybe I take up all space of the universe. When I know my limitations in that, in that, in that experience of honesty, I know now where I can reach beyond myself. And I can now connect with something beyond myself. I can connect with God 
knowing that I am not God because I have these limitations. So again, knowing my limitations allows me to reach beyond them when I'm not aware, and I know aware is a weird word. I, I don't mean aware. I mean, when we don't really feel it, our limitations, it's really hard to grow. It's hard to grow because what, what, where am I growing? Everything's good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm not looking, I'm not being introspective. I'm good. So there's nothing as whole as a broken heart. Or as Leonard Cohen once said, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in, right? There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So it's that, it's that experience of, of, of breaking open, of the heart recognizing its own limitations, the being, the human being recognizes their own limitations that really allows us to reach a place of completion. And in that state of completion, we can connect with God. So this is just a clarification of what we said before. We said before that God, that character development is important, even as we focus on action and getting the mitzvah done, doesn't matter how we feel, just do it, do the right thing. Yeah, but God wants to hang out with us. And for God to hang out with us, we have to work on ourselves. What does it mean to work on ourselves? A big piece of that is humbling ourselves, not humbling ourselves, but recognizing our inherent limitations. Take a look at text number seven. This is also from the Zohar, and it provides the perfect counterpoint to what we said before about God only dwelling in a, in a perfect place, in a complete place. The Zohar says, text seven, if you ask, but doesn't God only dwell in broken places, in broken vessels? As the verse states, I will dwell among the crushed and humble in spirit. The Zohar explains, yes, that is true, because the broken are the most complete of all because they lower themselves so that the ultimate perfection of God can dwell within them. This is the true completion. When we are broken open, when we are not puffed up with ego, and, and, and really the ego is a, it's a protective mechanism. It's self-protection. It's because we don't want to feel vulnerable. We don't want to confront our own fragility or our own shortcomings. So we tell ourselves how amazing we are, how infallible we are, how, how invincible we are, right? We tell ourselves that narrative so that we don't feel that discomfort. But in doing so, we rob ourselves of the ability to really connect with something higher. So the broken vessel, the broken heart, the one who feels crushed due to their own inadequacy, not to a an unhealthy place, but to a you know, moderate place, that is the true form of completion. Which is why in Torah terminology, a Torah scholar is called, help me out here, unmute yourself. Yeah, Mark, it's Art Simpson, exactly. What is the name of a Torah? What do we call a Torah scholar? Someone who's well-versed in Torah? Talmud Chacham. What does that mean, Talmud Chacham? It means a student of wisdom. Why a student of wisdom? Why not? a wise person, why not chacham? Why talmid chacham, a student of wisdom? The answer is humility, openness, right? The whole idea here is that even as we accomplish, even as we achieve, even as we study, we're open to the fact that there's something beyond us. We're open to the fact that we are but a student of wisdom. We haven't mastered wisdom yet, even if we have on some level. We're not masters of wisdom, we're students of wisdom. That's the contrition, and that's the I call it broken, open, sensitivity, vulnerability. I'll call it honesty. That's the honesty that's required of a person to really be in a relationship. And the truth is, it's not just about a relationship with God. Try to be in a relationship with another human being and not be honest about your vulnerabilities and your failings. It's not going to work. Unless they're also pretending, and then it's, uh, all right, then it's uh, an, an Instagram relationship where everyone's putting on their best face and nothing's real. Fine. That, that's not a real relation. A real relationship. To allow someone to get close to, to me means that I have to be honest and I have to be vulnerable and I have to be first and foremost honest to myself and know my own shortcomings. Because if I don't, then who and what am I? The Kotzker said, same rabbi, same Hasidic rabbi. If I am I because you are you, and you are you because I am I, then I am, I am not I, and you are not you. 
But if I am I because I am I, and you are you because you are you, then I am I, you are you, and now we can have a relationship. Don't ask me to say that again, right? In other words, if I am I because you are you, and that means if I'm pretending to be something because I think that's what you want to see with me, and you're pretending to be something that you think I want you to be, no one's being honest, no one's being vulnerable, no one's being open, no hearts are being you know, put out there. It's all like, yeah, look at this. It's, I'm not I, you're not you, and there's no relationship. But if I am I because I am I, if I own myself, own myself, meaning if I own who I am, not in an arrogant way. This is who I am. I can do this. I can't do that. Right? I, I, I succeed at this, and, I, and I, I'm challenged in that area. Right? If I'm honest with myself, I know my shortcomings. I know my limitations. I know what I can do and what I can't do. I know where I need help. If I'm honest with myself, and you're honest with yourself, now we at least have a shot. If we're pretending, then there's no relationship. If we're honest, we can have a relationship. And so what's needed from a Hasidic perspective, from a mystical perspective, to have a relationship with God is that level of honesty, vulnerability, transparency, which in the language of the mystics is called a broken heart. A broken heart. What does it mean that you're like dep depression? It doesn't mean depression. A broken heart means you're open, you're vulnerable, you're re it's being real. It's being real in a relationship. Humility. Humility, yeah. Part of, yeah, it's driven by humility. Driven by a sense that I'm not, uh, that it's not all about me. So I want to end with, a second here. I'll end with this idea. You find something unique in Torah scholarship that you don't find in any other, other discipline. And to be honest, I, maybe in one or two classes in the past many years that I've been teaching, have we focused on this in one of the classes that I've taught at least. As you may know, the rabbis often disagree with each other on matters of Jewish law. If you open up the Talmud, you're guaranteed to find on any page a disagreement, right? One rabbi says this, the other rabbi says that. Had they, had they come to the halacha, had they come to the law, what, what do you do when you have a dispute amongst great sages, right? The, oh, both like, a, like brilliant scholars, but one says, you know, kosher, one says not kosher. What do you do? Is it kosher or not kosher? The way it works is in Jewish law, achare rabbim lahatos, which means you follow the majority. They would present their arguments in the Beit Medrash, and then then they would vote, or the court would vote, whatever it was. They would vote, and the majority opinion became the law. That's, that's the way it worked. It's, it's not not that different to um, other other um, mechanisms of law. In our courts, also Supreme Court, for example, they might issue a decision one way or the other, and it might be a split decision, five four. And you have the opinion of, of the majority, the opinion of the minority, and each one has their opinion. The law is in accordance with the majority, but the minority still has, a, still has an opinion. Truth is, even within the majority or minority, you might have different reasons why, you might have a difference of opinion as to why they were on that side. They might not agree with each other even on that side, but that's not, that's not really germane to the discussion. Here's the point, it's a very simple point. There's no imperative in the United States of America, that after the law is, after the Supreme Court rules on a matter, that the judges that were in the minority have to concede to the majority. There's no imperative, right? You're still the minority. You still have your, you still have your opinion. You're in the minority, so the law is not like that, but you still have your opinion. You don't move. You don't change your opinion. But wouldn't you know it? In Jewish law, it's different. And again, have we discussed this before? If you're joining me tomorrow night for Curious Tales of the Talmud too, we'll encounter a story that's very, this will, this, this is a perfect lead into tomorrow night's class, by the way. Yeah. But in Jewish law, it's different. In Jewish law, it's different. When you had two scholars and the halacha, the law was in accordance with one of them, the other one needed to get on board. What that means is they were required. Who required it? It was a self-driven imperative that 
you have to now look at the story. The majority was like the other opinion. You have to re-examine the case, re-examine the arguments, and start to understand the other perspective. It doesn't mean that you can never have another, another opinion. What it means is you have to do the work to be open to understanding the other opinion. Hillel and Shammai. Yeah, yeah. It's born of respect, but it's also born of, as my mother said, as hum uh, mom, as you said, humility. It's born of the recognition that I don't have it all figured out. And even if my knee-jerk reaction, my gut reaction was different than yours, I can take a step back and I can be vulnerable enough to challenge myself and my, and my impression. Because at the end of the day, my first reaction is primarily to be driven by my experience, subjective experiences, subjective feelings, subjective patterns of thinking. It's gonna be very subjective. So what I'm doing in this process is being open, is being open to understanding. There's a vote. The other one has the majority. Okay, my work now is to understand that a little bit better. Will I abandon my, my, my original position completely? I could still think that that might, might also be valid. But it's not about abandoning positions as much as it is about being open to other positions. The question is, are we open or are we closed off? This is the key, Jewishly, to character improvement. The key to character improvement is being open to change. And that requires the recognition that we're not yet there, that we're not yet perfect. We can't develop our character if we think we're already finished and there's no development. So in conclusion, today's class, a lot of themes, but they all, hopefully, they're all circling around the same core point. And the core point is Judaism demands that we walk this line between post and pre-Sinai. Post-Sinai tells us that action is critical, action is paramount, what we do is what matters. You may not like it, you may not be excited about it, <coughs> do it anyway, that's what the main thing. You're not so excited about giving stuff, give it, you make a difference, change someone's life, you know, support an organization, do it anyway, it's a mitzvah. You may not want to dive in, dive in, it's good, it's a mitzvah, fine. Kosher, same thing. So that's on one hand. On the other hand, we can't we can't neglect our characters because that means that God is not uh, is not part of our lives. So if we are the ambassadors, if we are divine ambassadors on earth, doing the godly tasks on earth, we have to be good representatives. We our moral character. I want to say moral. I mean our spiritual character has to be tended to as well, <clears throat> and that requires development and work and honing our character. Our character and that is predicated on a sense of humility, contrition, a broken heart, an open heart, a vulnerable heart to recognize where we can still grow. So my blessing for all of us is that we should, from time to time, look, look inward, put everything on the table and ask ourselves, what's working? What's not working? Where can I improve? And then take steps. Think about it and take steps to improve it. It may not end up on the checklist, on the, on the mitzvah checklist, all that inner work, but it's what constitutes our connection and relationship with God. So as, uh -huh. we, as we experience this week of lech lecha, which means go forth, as God tells Abraham, go forth on your journey of life, we're reminded also that every journey begins with a vulnerable proposition. Are you willing to step out of your comfort zone? You have two feet firmly on the ground. Are you willing, are you able to lift one leg up and take a step and then lift that other leg up and take another step and unanchor, untether ourselves from what we know from what we're comfortable with to grow? It's very difficult. It's not, diff it's, it's not easy, but it's, it's the job of life. All right, we'll officially close out. I'm still here for questions, comments, and discussion. But we'll officially close out. Thank you very much for joining me tonight for Torah Studies. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope this week is indeed a week of growth and vulnerability and connection and action, learning from post Sinai and learning from the patriarchs as we grow on this journey called life. All right. Thank you very much. Rabbi, for Rabbi. Yes. Rabbi. Jump okay. In.
uh, let's go back to the $10 bill that fell out of someone's pocket. Okay. Yes. So we're told that the highest level of giving to DACA, you don't know who you're giving it to, right? And they don't know who it's coming from. So right. is does that count as tzedakah when the $10? Yes. yes. That might be the highest level of tzedakah, as you're saying. No, yes. it's not the highest level. It's not the highest level. The highest level is helping someone be sustainable yeah. on their own. But, yes. the, but the second level down, you're right, is giving right. anonymously, where you don't know who's receiving and, and they, they don't know who gave. In right. this case, it's the ultimate. You have no idea that you even gave. They right. just found it on the street. Yeah, that would be a high level of tzedakah. And you would get that mitzvah, even though... <laughs> Even though um, you didn't know it, there's in fact there's a mitzvah that there's one mitzvah in the Torah that can only be done when you forget about it. You know what that is? Anybody know? There's a mitzvah that when you're gathering the produce from your field, if you forget some bundles, you're not supposed you have to, to leave it. it. So that's the only mitzvah that you can do when you forgot. Right? That's the it's the most it's the only you can only do the mitzvah if it was unintentional. If you intentionally left it there, then you're allowed to go back and get it. It's only when you forgot about it, when it's unintentional, that it becomes a mitzvah. The Rebbe says in a different talk, but that's the highest level of mitzvah, a mitzvah that is so purely soul that it's not even passing through the brain. We might apply the same thing over here. It's almost like my soul made me do it. But either way, the point is that, yes, to answer your question, it's a mitzvah. It's a higher level. It's a high level mitzvah tzedakah. And it's born of a complete lack of awareness. You may never even know that you did it. You may go through the, your whole life. I mean, I would venture to say without a question that all of us have lost something and not realized whether it's money or I don't know, anything, a pos any possession. I mean, stuff, I've, so obviously there are things that we know we lost and we never find, but things that we've lost that we never even remember that we lost that helped someone else out. Yeah, we've all had that experience without, without ever knowing. It's never, it's never going to come back to us, at least in this form of life in a body so so what's the message it's a mitzvah at the same time it's a mitzvah to work on ourselves and become more generous more giving more loving more introspective more open vulnerable etc as we discussed okay other questions or comments i have something yes well, haven't we been told that I, you shouldn't have the attitude of well i'm not going to put on to fill until i understand it or until it has meaning for me you can't you're not supposed yes. to wait for that. You're supposed to take the action. And then the act, the more you do the action, you'll get to that place where you. Yes, exactly. So, right. So what Sarah's saying is post-Sinai, the order, right? We're saying that there has to be a, even post-Sinai where it's more action oriented. We still study the story of the patriarchs to remind us that we still have work to do also on the inside. But as Sarah is reminding us, what is the order? Action first, character second, because the main thing is the action. And the action also, as you're adding, can also lead to the feeling. The Rebbe wrote, I, you know, I, I'm, as you, some of you know, I'm working on a book now of, of letters of the Rebbe, and the Rebbe uses this analogy very often in his correspondence and also in his public talks as well. The idea that if you walk into a room and it's dark and there's a light switch, you don't wait till you say, I, I, I want to feel comfortable with the light switch. Like, I don't know how it works. I don't know why when I hit that. Grab by the light, there's a delay. Even told that. I mean, one second, one second, one second. So, so the Rebbe explains that there is a, sorry, it was, I, I just had a, had a mute for a second, um, that when we don't know how something works, we don't desist from trying. It, we could learn about it later and we can, we can become an electrician and an engineer and all that stuff, but we should still like you go to a doctor, right? Go to a doctor and the doctor says you need this medicine. So what do you say to the doctor? No, I need to understand how the medicine works before I understand, before I become a doctor and understand the medicine, I'm not going to take it. That would be silly. That would be dangerous to wait until we're proficient understanding exactly. And this, that, or the other, that would be reckless. That would not be advisable. So yeah, exactly. What Sarah's saying is true. A mitzvah is a good deed. It's something that God wants us to get done on this earth. We got to do it. That's step one. Step one is action. Step two is now let me figure it out. And that happens through the process of, of being open and humble as we discussed. All right. I think, Steve, you were jumping in. 
or others? I have a I have a question too. Um, yes. So I understand that if it drops out of your pocket and it's you and, and somebody takes it and they're able to do something good like feed their family or whatever, that it's a mitzvah. But what if that $10 drops out of your pocket, somebody takes it and does something that's not good with it? Um, that's not a mitzvah. Well, I know it's not a mitzvah, but it, you know what what does that become then? Because it's a, it's a sin. It's one of the worst sins. You now enabled a crime. They, that's no, I'm the, kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But no, I'm but very, that, but if you I, use I the understand. logic, it would it you would use that logic that if it drops out of your pocket and you don't know about it and it goes for good, then you know it's a mitzvah. Then the reverse logic is if it drops out of your pocket and it's used in a drug deal or, you know, right. whatever to go buy it. Various gun. purposes, right. 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 And and that that it would be, you know, the opposite would be true. Right, right. Good, 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 good. I, I don't have a good answer. What I will say is that, thank God, God judges us on the more generous side and not on the more judge and not on the negative side. So we're, we're, we're given this idea once that hold on one second. We're given the opportunity to um able to do something good like feed their family or hold on one second. whatever that it's a one second. So what we're what yeah, we're, we're getting uh, we're getting a uh, um some some reverb. So what what we have in our tradition is like this. What does that become then? Because it's a, it's a sin, it's one of the worst sins. You now enabled the crime. Hold on, Steve, Steve, Steve. It's, uh, there's a delay here. Hold on. You got, I got, I, Steve, I got to mute you. I love you, man, but I got to mute you because it's you logic that if it drops out of your <laughs> Got to mute you, man. All right. Um, all right, all right. I, we got to close this out then. All right, my friends, it's great to see you all. Um, have a wonderful evening. I, I just have one, one question. Yes. The que is the question, is it, it, you, you once said that answer. when we, we do what we're lacking in the, in, when we perform a mitzvah, other, when we perform it together as a community, as a group, that counts as if we are all fulfilling the mitzvah with uh, the same um, goodness and purity. As a so as a perfect we're person. Getting, we're getting a, uh, Say it again. When we do a mitzvah with the community, uh, then then we are we we get the credit. We each get the credit for the completeness of the of the community. In other words, what we're lacking when we're fulfilling the mitzvah. Let's say we don't have a complete kavana, but the other person that has has kavana in this sentence has intended in this sentence of the prayer. Right. And right. The other, so you once you once right. made that point, and I'm just right reiterating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can augment each other and help out right. each other. But I mean, yeah, exactly. The Karen's question, though, you're right. There, it may be asymmetrical. In other words, it may be that God is hooking us up with the benefit of the good conduct of the good outcome but not holding it against us when there's a negative outcome, when it goes to nefarious purpose. And that doesn't sound um, intellectually consistent or, or conceptually consistent. And to that, I say it's a very good question. But my understanding is it doesn't work both ways. <laughs> Thank God it doesn't, right? Because who knows what unintended consequences might have come up. Unless we were reckless and then, you know, then it's a negligence, but otherwise but, unintended consequences. But I'm are. saying the community adds each person adds to the completeness of the other. You right. made that point in, a, in another class. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that even if we're not perfect, right? And it's uh, even if let's say we pray and we don't say that specific sentence, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Good. So, what's the bottom line? Action is 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 critical. Action is the main thing. But as Mark just right, intent is also important. Kavana is important, and so we work on the outside and the inside. And with that. We become a whole person. Now, a few quick announcements. Number one, tomorrow night, if you're not yet part of it, jump in. Curious Tales of the Talmud 2. It's a lot of fun. But, I mean, we're yeah, gonna, exactly. Karen's question. We're going to explore a, an incredible story of, um, of the Talmud, uh, a debate between two rabbis about an oven. 
which is going to be just absolutely unforgettable. So join me tomorrow night at eight and, 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 and join me next week on Tuesday night. Well, we have two class. We have a new class starting Monday night, Hot Topics with Rabbi Edelman. It's going to be a, an amazing class. Some of the most modern and, and cutting edge topics in technology, medicine, um, just modern topics from a Jewish perspective, debate and discuss with us next week, Monday night. And then Tuesday night, we have a brand new, we have a, a one night only exclusive judge, Rachel, Rachel, Ruchi, Fryer, call her what you will. She is an incredible person. We call her Judge Ruchi. She is the first woman Orthodox um, person to be appointed in a public position or an elected, uh, elected public official in the United States of America or appointed in a government role. She is a criminal judge in New York City, and she's going to be speaking about her journey and uh, breaking glass ceilings. That's all happening next Tuesday night. The, 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 um, the, the title of the event is called The Hasidic Superwoman of Night Court. And that comes from a New York Times title um, a feature with that same title. So join us next Tuesday night for an inspiring and powerful event, 8 p.m. live on Zoom. It's Zoom only. She'll be in New York. We'll be here or wherever. Join us then. All right. I want to wish everybody a good night. Lila Tov. Take care, everybody. Bye.